many of you will have heard the behaviorist illustration that says that if you drop a frog in hot water, it will jump out immediately, but if you put it into cold water and raise the temperature very slowly, that the frog will complacently sit there until it is cooked to death. It's a great illustration of how we either react or fail to react in the midst of a crisis. If a horrible situation arises all at once, we know that we have to quickly respond and meaningfully change. But if it creeps up on us very slowly, with a very gradual evolution of circumstances, we may just slumber into our own demise. And as it goes, that illustration is helpful when it comes to things like climate change. The only reason that we are still burning coal to generate electricity and burning gas to power private individual automobiles is because the poisoning of our environment is so slow. It's so gradual that it's not easy to say on any particular day that today is the day that we should stop burning coal and driving private cars. So the slow boiled frog illustration is true when it comes to humans and environmental disaster. It is not, and let me stress this, it is not true about frogs. I don't know what kind of sick high school science uh, experiment started this, but a frog will jump out of water that gets too hot if it has time and opportunity to do so. I don't know how many frogs have given their lives senselessly in this illustration, but they don't like to be cooked. Which in a way is kind of sad because a frog knows not to sit quietly in an environment that is about to kill it, but the most arrogant and evolved intelligent beings on earth apparently are willing to sit quietly in our environment until it becomes toxic enough to kill us. I love this text from Isaiah that David read for us this morning or recited for us. The prophet asked people why they keep spending their resources on things that don't really satisfy them. Did joining the country club really give you that close-knit circle of friends that you thought it would? Did building a bigger house make you feel as important as you hoped it would? After stockpiling guns and ammunition all around your house, do you feel safe? It's like drinking a Diet Coke because you're hungry. Even if you could drink a thousand Diet Cokes, you'd still be hungry because in spite of its sweet and bubbly uh, taste, there is no food value in it. The prophet is, of course, not talking about food. He's asking why people spend their time and their resources on things that not only don't satisfy them, but might very well kill them. It's a good question. Why do we keep doing it? Jernigan Moltmann wrote in his book, A Theology of Hope, that there is something called the sacrament of the status quo, that the way that things are right now come to be viewed as holy. 19th century missionaries who went from the United States to teach Christianity in Africa, New Zealand, Indonesia, could not imagine the Christian faith apart from Western commerce, apart from an American-style government. Many succeeded in passing along the faith, but they were in many ways better at spreading the markets for Coca-Cola and America's addiction to cigarettes. In many places in the world, Christian missionary churches are a fading memory, but Marlboro and McDonald's are there big time. We don't have much mass transit in the United States because we have cars. We have cars because we make cars. And because we make cars, we build roads. And even though our cars and our roads are destroying the planet, we cannot receive a, conceive of a world without all of those cars and roads. And when the dinosaur juice starts to run out, then we start looking for ways to intimidate and control countries that still have some dinosaur juice. Because we cannot conceive of finding alternative ways of transporting ourselves and alternative energy, we would rather literally start a war to maintain the status quo. Because the voice of the prophet, or we could say the voice of the poet for that matter, is rarely heard in our day. 
really only in church and not very often in church. Almost every minute of every day, we deal with the way that the world is, and we have great difficulty thinking about how it might be. And eventually, you get to the point that you cannot even imagine the world as being different from the way that it is now. In fact, when you hear politicians talk about it, we have to do whatever it takes to maintain the status quo, a military-based economy and society, even though we know that we're the frog in the pan with the high school student turning up the Bunsen burner. Our generation is like a person standing on a set of railroad tracks watching the locomotive barreling down on them and we do not have the energy or the commitment or the determination to just move to get off the tracks. I mean, I, I know you all are tired of hearing about the sequester. I am. But did we not know this was coming? And you see a set of circumstances that requires an intelligent response. And we are incapable of reaching it because the status quo itself becomes sacred. And I raise the question of why are we still burning coal? And I, I don't... I don't want to sound too strident about this, but I, I was publishing in the paper in my column several years ago that Springfield, Missouri would be one of the last coal-burning fire pl uh, plants built in the United States because it was bad technology, it was poisoning the environment, it was bad economically, it was bad health-wise, and it turns out when you factor in the health costs that burning coal to generate electricity is the most expensive way to generate electricity on the planet. The only difference between clean coal and coal is the addition of the word clean that has nothing to do with the word coal. But we built it, and why did we build it? We voted, we got to vote, and we voted against it, and we built it anyway. Now, what does that tell you about democracy? Now, again, um, I always, I think it was Lenny Bruce who said that if voting actually changed anything, they wouldn't let us do it, but I, I wonder why, when we voted against it and, and the city decided they were going to build it anyway, why didn't we go stand in the streets and block the construction vehicles? I mean, why, what, what is it about our society that we've become so complacent that we will just let something like that happen that we know is directly poisoning us? And we just let it happen. Much the same way when we voted about conceal and carry weapons in, in Missouri. We voted against it. The legislature approved it. I don't know why we even bother voting sometimes. Because apparently in Missouri, what we vote for can be completely ignored. And what they cannot ignore is when we physically take it to the streets. And I don't know why we don't do that more. I, I, I wish that this church had been founded at the time that we took that vote on the coal plant and we could have organized a physical protest that could have blocked the roads and said, we told you no. And in this case, no means no. We really have to begin to, to get past the sacrament of the status quo if we are ever going to take anything about environmental change seriously. The prophet Isaiah asked the people of his day, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Why do you dig in and entrench yourself in a culture that is based on controlling the rest of the world through militarism so that you can consume more and more stuff that makes you sick and fat? Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? It seems that all the power in the world is either economic or military. And you don't need for me to tell you that the church in almost every century, in almost every place, has been little more than the court jester for the forces of the marketplace and the military. The thing that has made this congregation so different is that we have nearly entirely rid ourselves of that bondage to the past, the kind of prejudice and superstition that are the general hallmarks of religious practice, so that we can try to actually hear these challenging words of the prophets. But when it comes to the environment, the church, historically, has been the lapdog of the marketplace. It is time for us to do some barking around here. 
It is time for us to raise our voices and to make it clear that we intend to change the status quo so that the planet and its inhabitants have a chance. The poet, the prophet, sings, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, even if you don't have money. Come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. If we will allow our imaginations to be infected by the poet's words, then the world as we know it can come to an end, and the world as God imagined it can emerge. We don't have to just stand on the railroad tracks and watch the world come to an end. We can help it to be reborn. Recycling plastic and paper is uh, admittedly a largely symbolic gesture, but we should do it because it gives us the discipline of, of thinking about saving the planet. And you, we really ought to stop producing toxic plastic. I mean, we make plastic out of gasoline and then we put it in the ground. How, how, what could go wrong? Uh, we could produce containers that are not inherently toxic. We just have to keep recycling until we can convince our manufacturers that we will buy products that come to us in containers that don't kill us. The fact that our church leased an electric car makes a statement, a largely symbolic statement, but a symbolic statement that needs to be made. We need mass transit, but until we get to mass transit, we need to try to burn as little gasoline as possible. And we should all live closer to where we work, and we should all plan our days so that we leave as small a carbon footprint in the world as possible. Even in the annex, we're trying to uh, not use disposable paper products and plastic products. We're trying to use uh, washable uh, glasses. We're trying to use uh, fabric uh, towels that can be washed and reused. These are in many ways symbolic gestures, but it's a taught lifestyle in order to change the, our relationship with the earth itself. If we go out and help, and we plan to, uh, to pick up trash out of local rivers, there's a, a day in the spring, I, uh, Lori is planning that, I don't see her here today, but if you spend a day walking through mud and muck, pulling out garbage out of local rivers, that may be symbolic as an individual effort, but you will not go home from that messy, horrible day and quickly and passively begin throwing stuff into a river again. It changes your relationship with the river. We can air condition our homes without Freon. We can grease our cooking pans without hydrofluorocarbons. We can even keep our underarms smelling fresh without deteriorating the ozone layer. We realized that we had a problem. We made changes with the chemicals that we used. And in many ways, the ozone whole has been healed because we changed the way that we behaved. It can be done. We've done it before, and we can do it again. The first thing is that we just have to stop being willing to passively stand on the railroad tracks while the train runs over us. And the second thing is we need to stop all that stuff about boiling frogs. They really haven't hurt us. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.